there's been some news about China buying up a lot of American farmland. Yeah. And I'm curious if it's hit your radar and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. I think China definitely is probably buying farmland. I think other countries are also investing in U.S. farmland. And uh, other, you know, U.S. large financial investing firms are buying up farmland for sure. And it, so that was, you know, you mentioned this sort of thought that generational it, definitely there is this sort of generation generational aspect of farming where land is inherited in the family but there's this huge you know reality right now where a lot of farmland is owned by what we call absentee landowners they don't live on the land they aren't the ones doing the farming they they uh so that's changed so many farmers now are managing relationships as tenants with with an investor firm that might be in new york city or a person that used to live in town and moved and they're in Chicago now working at some job. And so I'd say the majority of the land is actually not owned by the people that are farming it and is owned by people in, in other places. And so that's really changed our sort of concept of a farmer and the way that we think about how a farmer can care about a land. And how can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Good morning, everybody. My guest today is Brandon Schlotman, and he is on a mission to save America's land from destructive farming practices. Conventional farming practices result in more than 1.5 billion tons of soil erosion per year. Yes, you heard me correctly. That's not over a decade, it's per year. And according to Science Direct, in the last 40 years, nearly one third of the world's arable land has been lost to erosion and continues to be lost at a rate of more than 10 hectares per year. That's nearly 39,000 square miles per year. About 90% of U.S. cropland is losing soil above replacement rates, and it's a critical issue. According to the National Library of Medicine, globally, more than half of the calories consumed by people are, in fact, from grains. Brandon is a scientist at the Land Institute, a Kentucky-based nonprofit dedicated to finding new sustainable solutions for growing the food that we eat. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from Nebraska Wesleyan University, a PhD in Plant Breeding and Plant Genetics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and the Land Institute is primarily concerned with the massive loss of soil due to modern farming practices that threaten America's farmland and food security. I fall into the category that I think probably almost everybody does, and that is I know almost nothing about modern farming. But I yep. sure consume uh, products that come from modern <laughs> farming. And uh, it is, it's just one of those things. It just, we're so oblivious to it because I don't, I don't work in that world. I have no understanding of actually what it takes to put food on the table for everybody in this country, let alone worldwide. So I'm, I'm incredibly thankful that you uh, took the time to talk to us because like I said, when I'm asking you these questions, trust me, I'm technically asking them for other people, but I'm, they're coming directly from me. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And yeah, and it's, you know, it's food, but it's also fuel and it's fiber and it's, it's all these things that we're consuming every day. So. Yeah. How did you get into uh, the occupation that you have before we talk about exactly what it is that you're doing now and what you're focusing on? Give me the backstory on uh, Brandon. What's yeah, Brand Brandon is from from Nebraska. Pretty passionate about the state, and uh, both sides of my family have a long history in agriculture. And I I thought I wanted to be a farmer when I was really young, and then I you know thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, and then you know things kind of changed, and I didn't have the opportunity to farm when I was when I was went to college, and really tried to think through what. You know, a couple of things. One of them was like, okay, what you know, what jobs can you get in agriculture that are that are high paying? And then, you know, I ultimately decided to work at a nonprofit. So I'm not sure I followed through with that strategy long term. But but more importantly, you no, know, 
what are the ways that we make changes in agriculture? And one of the exciting ways is genetics and breeding and actually changing the, the plants that we're working with to, to fit better environments, to grow more food, to do, to do things better. And I got excited about that and went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin and eventually um, found the Land Institute, which is a which is where I work right now and an awesome place that it's a nonprofit ag research institute where we're really trying to think about when we make plants better, what does that mean? Does that mean better quality food? Does that mean better yields? Or can it mean something else, you know, better for for all of us that not only are consuming food, but, you know, we're drinking water, we're breathing air. We're interacting with our environment daily, whether or not we we think about it. Um, so, so one term that I have heard, um, and again, I'll be honest, I don't have a deep understanding of it, but GMO, genetically modified food, and you're talking about enhancing plants or food. Can you talk about that process and how and how people in the field that you work in are ensuring that the modifications? You know, people hear that term to include myself. Yep. Like, I don't want something that's genetic genetically modified. But yep. I also couldn't define for you specifically what that is. So if you could talk about that for a little bit. Yeah. So we are, we're all sort of modifying as breeders, the plants that we're working with. And so there's, there's a few different ways to do that. The, the classical way um, and people that have dogs or things like that, you know, you know, you might know your parents and their parents have some special pedigree that you can trace back. And so the sort of classical way is we pick two things that we like a lot for whatever reason and we cross them to try to make something that is actually better than both of those two things were on their own. Um, so that's classical sort of breeding genetic modification. Some historically, some of the other ways that have been used and still are used is actually sort of mutation based breeding. So we can use EMS or radiation to actually force genetic changes to happen in the in the plants or animals or things that we're working with. And that's a very random thing so that's that's sort of like we expose we expose the the things that we're working in to some sort of mutagenic compound and random stuff happens and we look for is this mutant good or better for for some reason and so that's been that's been happening for i don't know exactly but probably 100 years and actually a lot of the fruits and vegetables we use happen in that process um starting in the 90s we start to see new cultivars and varieties of plants coming out that are associated with this new term genetic modification which means that um, scientists have actually in some way or another actually inserted genes um, from a whole nother species potentially or a or a newly designed gene into a into a plant to allow it to do something completely new that's something that has been done and is still being done in some cases uh, the other sort of newer, more modern ways we're thinking about genetic modification are that we can actually go in and change, for example, you know, a, a single base pair in a genome of a of an organism from, you know, let's say we're going to change it from an A to a G, and that sort of change can turn off a gene, for example. So we're not bringing anything in; we're just turning off a gene, turning on a gene, shifting its function a little bit, and so that's sort of a new sort of sort of modern way that 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 GMOs are also created. And there's there's a lot of discussion about, you know, politically, uh, policy-wise, what what is a GMO and which of those things count as a as a GMO? And it's it's different in different places. So using your analogy, which I loved of the pets, uh dogs yeah. specifically, yeah. I am a huge fan of Rottweilers and also mini Dosh hounds. Uh okay. different. I don't think that those should be bred, even though I feel like there's somebody <laughs> out there who's trying to, what would that be? A, a Rosh hound, whatever it would be. Right. A Rot Rottweiler right. dog hound. I think, well, I guess they could do it artificially, which again, it's just, it's not a good breeding of the species and it would probably be the least capable dog uh, known to mankind. How do you ensure though, now switching that analogy over yep. to food, that the modifications don't have a negative outcome. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my son right now is watching a, a movie about zombies. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I and I just basically walk out of the room as soon as it comes on because I can't stand it. But how do we make sure that we're not modifying things that end up in a zombie apocalypse? Well, I think you're. That's a. Those are really fair and important questions. And you know, the, the U.S. we have a system where, for a GMO to be released into the landscape, there's a series of of tests and process and registration stuff that needs to happen. So 
in some cases we have specific, uh, I don't know what you call that, sort of monitoring infrastructure for that, uh, whether or not we all agree it, it's good enough or too good or too harsh or, or not harsh enough um, is hard. But, you know, one of the, the key ways is that as we move forward, we, we really need to continue to start thinking about why are we modifying things? Are we modifying them to make them healthier? Are we modifying them to be able to grow things more sustainably? Are we modifying them to, um, you know, or, or are we modifying simply to make them easier to grow um, with under certain conditions? And so I think that matters a lot. And I think some of these newer genetic modification technologies are a lot more targeted, meaning we we know what's going to happen when we do it. So the sort of mutagenesis approach I described is this very random, let's, let's make a whole bunch of mutants and try to find something that looks good. Uh, without really knowing if there's any a lot that's happened in the, in the meantime that that we're not sure of now we 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 have a lot of science that we can actually you know really pinpoint we know this gene is involved in in you know this specific thing and if we mess with it just a little bit um maybe we can make the change that we need without causing a whole lot of changes in the rest of the genome and uh almost all new varieties go through what we call sort of a variety trialing phase. So a plant breeding company or university creates a new experimental variety. They test it in many different environments. They put it through. So for example, like K-State University in Kansas, they have a, a wheat quality lab. So they're testing for all sorts of different quality parameters through the variety trial. So it's not just yield, it's also bread making quality, protein quality, fiber, other nutritional things. And so that that network does exist and there's really cool new companies. One of them that I like is called seed seed linked. Uh, that's uh, allowing that testing to actually move outside of just sort of the university or company framework that it actually uses a citizen science approach where they send seeds of these new varieties to, to home gardeners or farmers to try out and actually provide their feedback on how does it taste? How does it look? How does it? So, so those consumers are in some ways are getting to participate in this, process of deciding what's a good variety and what what do I want entering my my food system so there's a lot of new kind of exciting novel things happening there yeah it sounds like it for for somebody who I mean obviously you're entrenched in this space what would you say is the it, as far as on the genetically modified side of the house in the 21st mm -hmm. century what is what is the one thing that you could pinpoint that you're most excited about any have you seen any advancements that you are uh, excited about more than others well so I work at this place called the Land Institute, and we believe our vision is that one of the things that's really missing from agriculture is this this thing called perenniality. So we have annual plants. Annual plants you plant in the spring or sometime during the year, they live for one year, produce seed one time, and, and die. And if we think about our crops, almost all of our vegetables and our grain crops, those are annual plants. And uh, because they're annual, it means that they're not growing over the winter or for many years in a row and they're not kind of protecting the soil and the water and other key resources that 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 ensure our long-term productivity of agriculture and so we've sort of identified when we look at natural ecosystems there's two things that are there one most native you know prairies forests etc have perennial plants you can think of a tree trees are there for many 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 years uh, we also have prairies where the grasses and the other plants there are, are also perennial. They live for a long time. And that in high school, we learned this word succession, where you have a volcano or some disturbance event, and eventually you have this succession of plants and animals where you eventually you reach this uh, climax ecosystem. We want to do the same in agriculture by putting perenniality there. And so we know some plants are perennials, some aren't. We know in some cases the what makes a plant perennial might be just a, a, a small number of genes. And so I think there's this big opportunity to think about, can we change the plants that we're working on um, that we're all familiar with in terms of eating or using as fiber to become perennial and to really make this important ecological change in our agricultural landscapes that, that, uh, that could change a bunch. So that's something I'm excited about there's not a lot of evidence that we can do it at this point through a gmo approach um but as we learn more if it were possible i think that'd be a really exciting use of that technology so yeah that sounds like it'd be a massively powerful tool 
uh, kind of rewrite the ecosystem a little bit. Yeah. Yep. And we've already kind of rewritten the ecosystem, right? So we took where I live in Nebraska, we had lots of tall grass prairies. They were covered with grasses or other forbs year round for thousands of millennia. And we've taken that sort of ecosystem and modified it through agriculture to now be growing a few grain crops that are we use, or use tillage or herbicides every year to prepare that environment to plant them again. So we want to do some modification actually to get back to maybe what was what was most likely there in the past. How would you describe a, like a modern farming techniques? Could you unpack that like a traditional approach and then also the impact that it has on the environment? Yeah. So we've things are changing fast and there's a lot of of uh excitement around soil health right now but i would say in general for the past 100 years uh, we've been on this trend of reducing the number of crops that are on one farm so you know we can see i don't know if you can see in the background i have this sort of idyllic picture from the 1960s where you know a farm might have had 10 crops and 10 animals on their farm and we've seen a decline in that over the last the last 100 years to where I live right now in York County, Nebraska. We have two crops, pretty much, corn and soybeans. I would say probably 99% of the farmland in the county where I live is just planted to those, only to those two crops. Um, and is that an economic decision to go from a wide yep. variety? Yeah. yeah, there's definitely huge opportunity costs to, to grow those sort of main crops in a very specific way. So I farm a little bit here and I'm always trying to think of, well, what could I do differently? And, uh, you know, this year I'm planting 10 acres of oats, <laughs> mostly because I want to try something different. Not because, I mean, I'm sure that I'll end up, I'll, I'll miss out on this opportunity of growing those other crops, uh, without having access to big scalable markets. So there's an opportunity cost. We know there's demand always for these, for corn and soybeans in my county anyways. Um, and so that's sort of created the, the the shape of what it is right now. And What's the cost to the land, this specialization of the last hundred yeah. years where we've become more targeted? You know, everything comes at a cost. It's it's more yep. of a question of can we can we absorb the cost and is the risk to the future worth the reward that we're gaining now? Let's say absent any change, because we'll shortly get into what you guys are focusing on in the Land Institute, but let's say nothing were to change. What would be the yeah. long-term impact to the in environment locally where the farmers are consistently just regrowing the same crop? Yeah, I think a good example, I was just, I I was in, I have a, a friend that is from I originally, but lives in Palestine right now, and I just was there visiting him, and that, you know, you think of this Levant region or the Fertile Crescent, we call it, these countries israel palestine lebanon syria uh, that's that's where a lot of the crops that we think of and know were first domesticated um wheat oats barley lentils things like that and what's interesting is that there's actually not that much agriculture happening there anymore they've been doing agriculture for ten thousand years on pretty hilly slopes and they tried building these things called terraces to slow down the loss of soil and the erosion but but it hasn't worked 100%. And so there's many places where there's no soil left. It's just rock and they can't do agriculture anymore. So um, another example, I own 40 acres in, in Kansas and I do no tillage and actually now I'm planted everything to perennials. And next to me uh, uh, there and, and all around me, you know, there's people that have been growing wheat over and over again, using plows to till the soil and prepare each year. And they've lost enough soil. We have kind of shallow, vulnerable topsoils there where you you can see the sand. So we had this nice, important layer of real soil that determines the productivity. And underneath of it is a, a, a deeper layer of sand. And so we're having land, even in Kansas, uh, that's becoming less and less productive, less and less farmable. And I think that there's definitely a a trend that you know, maybe the 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 length, of, the long term horizon for when that's going to happen is different in every part of the U.S., um, but it's but it's coming uh, if we don't if we don't change practices. Are you looking for a change agent in the energy space? Look no further. Ketone IQ is 
a category leader. Fuel does not need to be filled with caffeine and sugar. HVMN is changing the narrative. No sugar, no caffeine, no BS. It's just calm, clean energy on demand that improves performance and cognition. HVMN was awarded a $6 million Phase 2 STTR by the U.S. Special Operations Command to produce a ketone-based product that would improve performance at altitude and protect against cognitive loss in hypoxic environments. I'll be honest with you, the flavor is rough, but what's real is the energy, the sustained energy that you will get when you take Ketone IQ. Actually, probably my favorite thing about it though, beyond the energy that you get from it or in addition to the energy that you get from it, is its size. I mean, you can stuff a couple of these in your backpack. It's not bulky. It's not a full-size drink. Throw it in your bag. Take one when you need it and you're off and running with clean, sustained energy. Please go check out our partner, HVMN, the brand behind Ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash change agents. I'll hit you with that one more time. Let's do it military phonetically. Hotel Victor Mike November.com slash change agents. Still got it. It's no big deal. To receive 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ. Hey everyone, Andy Stump here, the host of the Ironclad Original Change Agents podcast. In addition to producing podcasts like Change Agents, Danger Close with Jack Carr, Oil and Whiskey with Roadster Shop and others. Ironclad also works with some of the world's biggest brands like Mechanics Wear, Under Armour, the Navy SEAL Foundation, Anthem, and a ton of others to create industry-leading custom film series, commercials, podcasts, and more. We can also get your message in front of an audience of millions by placing it on podcasts and series just like this one. To check out more about Ironclad and see how they can help you elevate your company, brand, or business, check out thisisironclad.com. This is ironclad.com. I had, if I'm being totally honest, I don't think I had ever heard of or thought of soil erosion before looking at the notes, getting ready to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, so I think of erosion as uh, a river, you know, or the ocean is constantly just kind of like chipping away at things and carving the natural Mm-hmm. Uh, topography or the grand canyon right oh yeah there was right. a huge river or something exactly. like there was a massive giant that came through dragging an axe that might be a more of a children's story but it's hard to say what people believe in 2023 yeah yeah where, where is the soil actually going because i think of again eastern montana pancake flat yep. tons of agriculture out there where does the soil go i mean i'm, I'm assuming it travels somewhere but what's the mechanism where it actually does that yeah there's Two different, there's more than that, but there's two different main options that matter depending where you're at. I don't know a, a, a whole lot about Montana, but I'm guessing it's somewhat like eastern Colorado, western Kansas, and I lo- know a little about that. And that they have a lot of wind erosion, so without good precipitation um, and a lot of wind, the soil on top of the ground can become very dry. And uh, um, you know, when you use tillage or when you have periods of time where there's no plants going there, that soil is vulnerable to being picked up by the wind and and blown away. It can be blown hundreds, thousands of miles. And uh, um, so that's that's one type of erosion that 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 definitely happens all around the U.S. Does tilling uh, add to that as well because it loosens or disturbs that soil so it makes it more susceptible? Exactly. It loosens it and it exposes it and makes it more susceptible to this sort of wind blown erosion. Um the other kind of erosion is this water erosion. And um, when we expose the soil and, and uh, break up aggregates that kind of hold it together, um, especially with big rain events and in even a small slope, we can have the soil wash down hills into ditches and gullies and streams. And ultimately that kind of erosion, it's a local problem because you you, you sort of reduce your long-term productivity potential of that land that you're working on, but it's also a much broader problem. And when we think of like the Gulf of Mexico and some of the, you know, ways that we're calling it a dead zone, that hypoxia problem is really caused by soil leaving farms in the Midwest, uh, entering into sort of the Mississippi river and, and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico and bringing these rich nutrients, the nitrogen, phosphorus, things like that into the Gulf of Mexico out of farms 
that are causing sort of the algal blooms and other eutrophication problems. So, um, yeah, soil erosion not only affects the long-term productivity of a place, but it, but it can have negative consequences uh, all, the, all along wherever the water is flowing. So. so now getting to what you're doing at the Land Institute. Yep. What do you guys have in mind for, I hate the term solution, um, yeah. you know, as for maybe a working fix or something that we could do to at least control or moderate that erosion? Yep. Yeah, so we're we're kind of dreaming and envisioning these crops that are perennials. So we we erosion is something that's natural, just like the Grand Canyon that you mentioned. And even in a natural prairie or forest, there are small, usually often amounts of erosion, but um, it's less likely to have these big events where we lose a lot of soil like at once that we have in agriculture. So we want to mimic those natural systems by by bringing what they have. They have perennials uh, and they often have diversity. So more than one plant species in one place at one time. And to do that, we're we're doing, we're, we're actually trying to create perennial grain crops. And um, we're doing that two ways. One of them is by domesticating brand new crops. And so th what that looks like, an example is uh, we have a crop called, that produces grain called Kernza. That's probably the, the one that is most recognizable in the US. And that's a species of grass called intermediate wheatgrass. We've actually planted it in the U.S. as a forage crop for cattle and as a component of what we call CRP land. There's a lot of CRP in Montana where you are. Yep. That's the conservation reserve program where we take land out of grain production and plant it to perennials to try to protect and conserve some of the soil. And so we actually have been breeding that species for the last 20 years, trying to make higher yield, bigger seeds, um, other characteristics that make it easier to grow in agriculture uh, as a sort of alternative or maybe, um, yeah, an alternative to to regular wheat or other regular cereal grains. So we, we're doing a lot of that. The other thing that we're doing is thinking about using what we call wide hybridization approach, which is you know, maybe like your Dash and Rottweiler, Rottweiler idea where we... Please nobody do that. It's, we, it's just, <laughs> I can't even imagine what that dog would be good at other than sitting there and eating food. Yeah, so we... <laughs> We, uh, what we want, so you can imagine there's this one thing that you like about a Rottweiler. In, in our case, wheat has relatives that are, that are related to it that, that are perennial. And so we'll try to cross wheat with, with a wild relative that's just maybe some native wild grass growing somewhere to try to bring this sort of perenniality into, into wheat. Um, and so there's, those are kind of two approaches and we're, we're working on, crops that are kind of like wheat. We're working on crops that are kind of like sunflowers. Um, I have a breeding program. I work on a crop called Sanfoin, which is a is something that we're thinking about trying to make into our perennial sort of pulse crop, a pea, lentil kind of thing. And uh, there's a lot of Sanfoin grown in Montana where you're at. I have a lot of farmer friends that we're trying to work with a little bit in developing that crop. I'd have to assume that most farms in the U.S. are passed on generationally. I, I mean, I'm sure there are, are some people who are like, you know what? I'm done with Wall Street. I'm going to go be a farmer. And they go do something amazing. But I have to imagine most of these are, are generationally passed on. So the families, I'm sure they can see the writing on the wall or they can see the historic trends of where yep. their family farm came from, where they are right now, and potentially where they are going to. Yep. Um, and along those lines, how urgent would you say – that this issue is scale, not, not even necessarily on a scale, but how how rapidly do we need to address this before even just the soil erosion issue ends up uh, in the areas like you described, the Levant region, where yeah. you know the the foundation of most agriculture, and now they're unable to grow. Yeah, I'd say locally, it really depends where you're at. I think the soil erosion issue locally is hard to see in many places. Some places are really blessed with deep soils that that they probably have, you know, decades, if not centuries of time before it's obvious what those long term consequences are. There are other issues. So, for example, locally where I am, we use a lot of irrigation and a lot of nitrogen fertilizer to grow corn. And um, we're learning now and, and things are changing. But uh, when you use a lot of nitrogen fertilizer with irrigation, you can actually push the nitrogen down too far to where the corn can't get it. 
And once it goes down that far, really? it keeps going down into the groundwater where, which is what, which is the water we we drink. That's where our com our communities are dependent on that water. And so, if you look, and then we have a zombie apocalypse. Then we have a zombie apocalypse because uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we have a lot of health problems, you know, for children and and older people because of this reality that our water is contaminated with nitrates. Um, and that's a like a that's something that we can't continue. We know is going to be a problem. And if you look around the Midwest, lots of small towns are spending millions of dollars to put in um, water purification systems to remove nitrates. Um, many people can't drink out of the wells that are, you know, their great grandparents maybe dug at their houses anymore because they're contaminated with nitrates. So for me, where I'm at, that's the issue that I feel most passionately be about. And uh, Things like perennials have deeper roots, so they can go get nitrogen that's farther down in the soil where corn can't. Um, and then the way that that we apply nitrogen makes a big difference. So, you know, it sounds silly, but maybe one of the most exciting sustainable technologies where I live is this idea that uh, we use what we call fertigation. So the if you've seen irrigation pivots, they're these big, long, yeah. that make big circles. Uh, see them flying from east coast to west right. coast all yeah. the time and we used to put all of our fertilizer down in the fall or winter all at once and so there was this period of time you know if you put all your nitrogen down in the fall and you don't grow corn until the next summer there's this really long period of time where it's just sitting there and vulnerable to being leached into the ground and we figured out now that you can put your fertilizer on through the pivot actually so small amounts when the crop needs it um and it sounds silly that that's a sustainable technology, but for our, I think for our specific local region, that's a really, it hasn't necessarily uh, changed the way that the crops themselves look, but I think long-term it's really going to change the way that our, our groundwater and the, the, the water we're drinking. What do you wish that the average person like myself knew about farming that you think is, it's not necessarily lost on them, but they maybe don't pay attention to? Yeah. I think, you know, just from a farming family and living in, in multiple worlds, I think one thing that's really important is to recognize that, uh, you know, oftentimes we're afraid of words like GMOs and we're afraid and we think that, you know, farmers have big, big corporate farms and are kind of sort of disrespecting the land that they're working on. And and I think it's really important to recognize that farmers are 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 using these technologies because it's what's available to them and that many farmers have a, a great desire to be good stewards of their land. They want to do things differently and better. No farmer likes to put chemicals in a tank and spray it and, you know, risk his or her, her family's uh, health. And so I think it's really important to recognize that many of the farmers, they, they want to be good stewards of their land. They want to make important contributions to these sort of sustainability and conservation uh, visions that are maybe shared by people on on the coast. And so we, it's really important that we uh, see them in that way and, and, and work towards trying to understand how we can help them actually accomplish that goal. They're the, they're the ones that are stewards of the land and uh, they want to do a good job. And to do a good job, they need access to new tools, new crops, new things that make that more possible. Um, while fulfilling their role of feeding and 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 clothing and fueling the rest of the, our, our country. So slightly shifting gears, question for you, and maybe you have thoughts on this, maybe not. Yep. Um there's been some news about China buying up a lot of American farmland. Yeah. And I'm curious if it's hit your radar and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. I think China definitely is probably buying farmland i think other countries are also investing in u.s farmland and uh other you know u.s large financial investing firms are buying up farmland for sure and it, so that was you know you mentioned this sort of thought that generational it, th definitely there is this sort of general generational aspect of farming where land is inherited in the family but there's this huge you know reality right now where a lot of farmland is owned by what we call absentee landowners they don't live on the land they aren't the ones doing the farming they they uh so that's changed so many farmers now are managing relationships as tenants with with an investor firm that might be in new york city or a 
person that used to live in town and moved and they're in Chicago now working at some job. And so I'd say the majority of the land is actually not owned by the people that are farming it and is owned by people in, in other places. And so that's really changed our sort of concept of a farmer and the way that we think about how a farmer can care about a land. And one example I'll give you is I've been really interested in trying to think about how I can grow things more organically. I'm not lucky enough to have inherited or have access to a lot of family land. And so I, I'm required to lease land. And when you want to be organic, there's this three-year transition period of time. So you can't use fertilizers or or, or pesticides for that three-year yeah, period. Makes sense. makes sense. But it's a challenge for someone like me because I have to negotiate instead of a year to year lease, which is really common, I have to negotiate, you know, a, a, at least a four year lease where I have my three years of transition in just that one year of organic production. Um, so you really have a lot of this relationship building and management that's important. And we think about how do we transition to new sustainable, organic, whatever we want to say is important practices. The absentee landowners are a key part of that. They're, it's their land. Um, there are people like me that might be renting their land and the decisions that I make as their renter really depend on the confidence that I have that if I put money into this four years later, I'm still going to have access to it. Um, or like if I'm putting money into sort of the conservation, conservation practices that shared, do the landowner and I have the same vision for what uh, protecting the soil long-term looks like and how it matters. And are we sharing the costs? of that transition or is that all my responsibility is or that all the landowners responsibility? So those are, I think, new sort of realities and maybe tensions that are happening in agriculture. And I, I think it's easier to work with probably a landowner that grew up in Nebraska and now lives in Kansas city than a landowner that's in China for in a huge firm. So those are two different relationships for sure. So. Yeah, I'm not so sure how uh, how much I like the idea of a Wall Street firm deeply investing in farmland. Yeah, given given Wall Street's not everybody, but let's just say that uh, people in that industry, uh, in a broad description, have a history of acting in their own self interest right. and not necessarily right. the self interest of perhaps the land leaser, lease e. Right. Uh, and I'm certainly uh, pretty certain that China acts in their own interests. Yep. Most of the time, if not all the time, yep. I can't say I necessarily blame them for doing so because the United States does as well. But I'm not incredibly comfortable with them owning large portions of farming land in the United States of America. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's interesting <laughs> to think that 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 some yeah, interesting to think what as a country we have and haven't allowed over time and how those decisions get made. And I'm not involved in any of them, so I don't know how it works, but, but yeah, I agree. It's something. I, I would rather like to see our government figure out a way to reinvest back into the infrastructure that supports our own citizens. I would much rather see that. And honestly, as a taxpayer, I'd be willing. Well, what, there's a not to get onto taxes, but I'd love to know where my tax check goes. But like, can I get an exact, uh, landing spot of where my small portion of the yeah. tax money because i'd like to allocate that all towards buying farming land and sustaining yeah. what we have in this i'll pay double what china's willing to pay how's that <laughs> yeah well and i think that there's i don't know how many small towns in the middle midwest you've been to but i, I it's few awesome. yeah <laughs> it's really fascinating to me because a lot of them have these beautiful historic buildings that were built in the late 1800s, sort of early 1900s, big old buildings. There's the main street in town and they're beautiful. And there's this reality that I think is hard. I don't understand the economic conditions entirely, but most of those small towns haven't built new buildings and that hasn't changed in the last probably 50 or 100 years. And so there was a time when somehow there was money flowing into those towns and there was enough local economy to allow for that to be built. And now we see the opposite. We see a lot of the the money in our counties, in our towns, leaving and going to investors elsewhere or to China or to to wherever. It's it's not necessarily going back uh, to to furthering the improvement of our, our towns and, and rural America. So how can somebody at well downstream 
like yep. myself. Yep. How can I make a more educated decision? At, the reality is for me, and I think for most people, our touch point with farming is the grocery store. Yep. It's wherever you are going to buy something that started off in whether it be a family farm or, you know, wherever it begins, a corporate yep. farm, family farm, but it makes our way to the grocery store. How do I and others make a more educated decision with our dollars that could help support what you are doing? whether at the Land Institute or just the concept or ideology in general of more sustainable architecture or uh, agriculture? Yeah. Well, at the Land Institute, I think you can definitely, you know, we we receive donations from, you know, small $10 donations up to really large donations that continue our ability to to make progress in the research. Um, there's a the, a farm bill is, a, is this important component of U.S. policy uh, that gets signed and and every few years and whatever happens to be in that farm bill really kind of determines the directions that that research and agriculture in general look and that's coming up you could write to your congressman about um things that you care about there's probably if you search online in your area there's probably agricultural groups or uh, urban agricultural or rural agricultural groups that have specific things they are interested in and, and you can sign on to their petition. So that's something that is coming up soon and something that you could participate in. Um, you know, I don't know how accessible this is to everyone everywhere, but uh, for example, I have a small herd of, of cattle that's sort of meaningless when you think about the scale of it. But most of the beef that I raise, I sell directly to people uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, Omaha, uh, sometimes Kansas City. And uh, you should be able to look on different social media sites. So for in, in Nebraska, for example, there's come, there's Facebook page called Nebraska Farm Products. And it's very easy for anyone to post there. You know, I am interested in looking for locally raised meat or locally raised vegetables or whatever you want. And that's an opportunity. I think you'll be surprised how many small producers like myself will respond to your message and be happy to talk to you about what I'm doing on my farm. And that might not be sort of your vision for what you want agriculture to look like. And that's okay. Cause there's probably going to be a dozen other people that reply and you can really learn you know, this is what agriculture in my community looks like. And these are the options. And I can actually purchase meat directly from a person instead of going, going to the grocery store. And I think you'll find it's kind of fascinating to me. I, when I, when, what I sell my beef for is, is almost equivalent to what you buy in the grocery store. Uh, but when yeah. I sell a beef to a person, personally, the margin that I receive back for the beef is much higher than if I took it to a, a sale barn that ultimately went to a, a large processing plant in a grocery store like you. So um, I make more money doing that. The consumer gets to know the person and you, you can go to the place and see it. You can see the cow if you want. Um, so depending on where you're at in the U.S., even if you're near urban centers like Chicago, Omaha, uh, Minneapolis, there should be producers near you. You can, you're welcome to go visit. So. Yeah. I can only speak of the places that I've lived. I, most of my life I'd lived in uh, California, short stint of time out on the East coast in Virginia and now here in Montana. But what you're describing was available in all three of those areas, uh, both in well, four, I guess. So Northern California, Southern California, there was a possibility Virginia for sure. And then what you're describing here locally for me in Montana, I, my business partner buys half a cow, Per year, I don't know how he eats the whole half a cow per year, uh, but good on him for doing that. It's a, it's a large amount of meat. Also, people be prepared to buy a refrigerator if you're going to buy half of a cow. <laughs> it's a little bit different than going to the grocery store and getting a uh, ribeye steak one at a time, but it's definitely possible. Um, and I have I have found from a price perspective, it's generally equal. Maybe it's slightly more, but I'm willing to pay more for that interaction and the knowledge and understanding and the relationship with the individual that I am actually, you know, receiving that product from. What's the best way for people to learn more about the Land Institute and then support what it is you guys have going on? Yeah, I'd say we have a website that you can go to. We have, uh, I, I know at least Twitter and, and other social media accounts that we're accessible on. Um, and then, you know, I think there is oftentimes publications coming out in, in both local and national media about specifically this crop Kernza, but but other crops as well that there's a we've been supporting this development of perennial rice uh, and there's a big NPR article about that that came out a few weeks ago um and I think 
if especially depending where you're at, a lot of land grant universities there there might be one or two researchers at those universities that are starting to think about perennials and work on perennials. So I would I would say, yeah, watch the news. Closing thoughts by Brandon. Closing thoughts by Brandon. Well, I uh, I love agriculture. It's fun. I think it. You know, there's the word culture is in there for a purpose. That's that's what that's what a lot of our small communities. That's what the economy and the sort of rhythm of life revolves around. And it's a beautiful thing. We all should have access to communities in our lives and and have access to people that we know we can we can ask for help when we need it. Um, I think a lot of these small rural towns are a great example of of how important those communities are and what you can benefit from really trying hard to cultivate that community wherever you're at, whether that's in California, in a big city, build your community. Building community requires, you know, caring, caring about the people, caring about the place um, and reciprocating the care that you get back. So we should all try to do that a little bit better. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to learn more about Brandon's work at the Land Institute and see how you can help support them, please visit landinstitute.org. Normal spelling on all of that, landinstitute.org. 